we get to explore it. And we get to look at things that, that we like and pick those things and say, I want to be like that thing. Or maybe my purpose is to be like this thing. See, there's such a beauty in the innocence of, of being young. There's a, a beauty in that. Do you remember a time in your life, thinking way back where you had that? Do you remember a time in your life where it was just that simple? And maybe some of us don't, but I want you to try for this. Now, unfortunately, we don't hold on to this truth forever. And then, unfortunately, we don't stay uh, three-year-old and Spider-Man. And eventually, what happens in life is life kind of gets a hold of us. Life gets a hold of us, and it starts to kind of peel layers away from us and take things, you know, back from us. And, and Jordan, upstairs, before you go on to the next slide, go back to the first slide of Benjamin just smiling. See, see we, don't, we don't stay this way for the duration of our life. Wouldn't that be great if we did? Wouldn't it be great if every day was the greatest day? Wouldn't it be great if you just woke up and every day was full of safety? I mean, you could just, Benjamin just hurdles himself through life, not worrying about anything in the world except dreaming and playing. And and wouldn't it be awesome if life just stayed that way? But it doesn't. See, something happens along the way, and, and we lose this, and, and partly that's okay, but, but when we lose this, we, we go really far to the other side. And, and now, now, Jordan, you can put up the, the last picture there of, of uh, there we go. This is where we end up. So we lose, we lose the joy, and now we end up we, leaving and saying, I'm going to try and act like a normal, happy, mentally balanced person today. Wish me luck. Who can identify with this today, especially this time of year? Yeah, all of us can. But, but our, our goals in life change from I want to be and I want to experience and I want to create and I was made to be and experience and I was made to fulfill a purpose. And then life happens and we find ourselves saying, I'm just going to try and go out and look and act like I'm normal. But really what's happening on on the inside of our heart, our soul, and our mind is we're a little bit disheveled and crazy, and we're just trying to put on our best face. But but what what is it that takes us there? You know, the things that that take us there could be things like like things that hurt you, things that make you jaded. It, It could be your business. It could be work. It could be bills that you pay. It could be the addiction that you have. It could be the grief that you experience. It could be the sorrow, the pain, the broken relationships. It could be abuse, sin, bad family boundaries. That's a big one. Bad family boundaries. Social injustice. Being jaded. You've been hurt by something and now you're jaded. You think, you know, I no longer believe in this. I no longer trust this. You enter into a survival mode. And see, when life comes at us here... We lose that innocence, and our purpose starts to kind of trickle away. And we start to kind of lose sight of what our our purpose was. Why were we created? For which were we created for? What is the meaning of our life? See, I think that God gave us this ability to dream. He gave us this ability to have a wild imagination, and He put in us desires, and these desires are unique to you. Did you know that the things that light you up and excite you, and maybe they don't do that now, maybe you haven't even thought about those things for a long time, but at some point in time, you had things in your life that excited you, that lit you up on the inside. You know, those things are unique to you. Other people don't have those things. You have those things, and because you have them, it's unique to you, so God has given you a unique purpose. He's given you a unique set of desires. He's given you a unique heart. He's given you unique cares. See, God has made you unique. He's made you wonderful. You are wonderfully made in the image of God. And in each and every single one of us, he gave an individually uh, curated dose of your personality that makes you who you are, your purpose. But, But you've got all this life that happens that kind of clouds all of that. Are, are, are you guys tracking with me this morning? Can we see that at one point in time in our life, we, we lived in this special kind of innocence? And then now, where we are now, with all, all kinds of crazy things happening, bad things happening, and even, hey, even on the good days, things are still stressful. 
You know, even on the great days, when I've got, you know, a, a, a three-year-old that's screaming because he doesn't want to do something, and, and Wyatt is, you know, is, is throwing food all over the floor, and Casey's trying to, you know, manage all of that, and you're just sitting in the house, and it's hot, and there's no wind. There should be wind in Cape Town, but there is no wind right now, and so it's just hot, and there's no moving air, and it's humid, and you find, that's a good day. And even on a good day, I'm not sitting there thinking, my purpose is to pastor a church. Now I'm thinking, you know, where is the wind? <laughs> Why does Rondebosch not have wind? See, it, it's just, I say that to illustrate to you that, that this is hard to hold on to. So I, I've drawn a picture for you guys. Don't put it up. He put it up. <laughs> I wanted to explain it first, okay? So this is, this is my version of, of artwork. And... Um, I don't know if you guys can't see that. You, they can put it on. Okay, we'll make sure that we, you, everyone can see that there. So th- this, is, this, is, um, this is the kind of the best way that I could explain this, is that we find ourselves today. Okay, so I want you to, again, I want you to engage with this. There is a chance that there are people in this room that are maybe even in this moment for the first time realizing that they don't know what their purpose is, and that they don't know why they were made or why they exist, or that you remember what it was, you have remnants of it, but you're so far away from it that it was kind of a dream. And so here I've drawn you right here. I tried to stay gender neutral, race neutral, you know, here. So this is, everyone can kind of identify with this here. And then, and then across this gap, you have your purpose. And obviously, where you have your purpose, it's blue skies and there's, there's sunshine. And in the middle of this gap, there's clouds here because there's often difficulty. And um, I forgot to draw rain, but there's the clouds. And then down here, you have like spikes and traps. I, I tried to draw an alligator. I couldn't draw an alligator. So I just have all this horrible stuff at the bottom there. And these red lines going across, those are lasers. So <laughs> if you fall down, you, you know, the, the, I guess the sinus medication I was on was really working <laughs> when, I, when I drew this. But this is you on one side, and you're looking across what seems like this impossible gap. And you're saying, okay, I, if, if Pastor Chris is asking me to engage in this and think about this and, and consider that, you know, okay, I've got this, this, this purpose in my life. Okay, what, what was that? And that's starting to come back to the forethought of your mind. You're starting to think about it and consider it. You know, it, then, but, but it just feels so far away. How, how am I going to get back to that? Because we still have bills, life is still hard, still have kind of direct relationships and family, or I just have a ton of stuff to do, or I've just done a ton of stuff and I don't have anything left in me in order to go and reach for any kind of purpose. What is this guy talking about? I just want to go to the beach and go on vacation. But we're, we're separated here. So I just want you to know this. This is not God's will for you. It's, this isn't God's will. Now, your purpose is not always going to be blue skies and sunshine. But this, this isn't God's will. See, God's will is that you walk in your purpose. And at least that you know your purpose. And so today, what I hope to do with you is I, is I hope to kind of reset and restore your purpose. So the, the, the message today is that when you walk out of here, You've at least had a bit of a reset and a restoration where you can at least grasp the idea that I can cross this gap and I can achieve my purpose. I can, I can live in the way that God designed me to live. So in order to do that, the first thing that we need to do, I'm going to give you a couple steps, and then we're going to look at some Scripture, and then we're really going to kind of go on, on a journey together with this Scripture and pull a few key things out of it that you can do. And so then the idea is, as you do those things, they overflow out of you. And as they overflow out of you, your purpose kind of starts to develop in your life. And then because of that, you become generous with your purpose and you help other people find, find their purpose. But the first thing that we need to do, the first kind of objective is that you need to wake up. We need to wake up and be reminded that we were created with significant purpose. So here's the thing. If, if, no one, if you don't want help, you will not receive help. If you don't want to change your life, then there's no way that life change is going to come for you. If you're content with saying, you know what, I just, I'm fine with where I am now. I don't need to think about purpose. I, I'm okay. The, this idea of, you know, I, my life is pretty good. I can settle for what I have right now. 
Well, if that's you, then you're never going to step into or achieve the, the full potential of the purpose that God has made you for. And so the first step that we have to do is we've got to kind of wake up and be reminded that, hey, you know what, where I am right now is not where I have to stay. That's the biggest realization that we have to wrap our head around is that, listen, I want, I want you to say this to yourself in your, in your mind. Say it kind of inside your own head of where I am today is not where I have to stay. And so where you feel hopeless, you're not going to stay hopeless. Where you feel overwhelmed, you're not going to stay overwhelmed. Where you feel disconnected from your purpose, you're not going to stay disconnected from your purpose. You know why? Because we're going to stop settling for where we are today. And we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to stay there. Because we're going to wake up and we're going to accept the truth that Jesus has given us a full and wonderful and exciting life. And he's made each of us with a unique purpose. I was made for which a, a, a design, God made me in a design, in a way to do something unique to me. I have a purpose. There's meaning to my life. And so I'm going to wake up and accept that. And I'm no longer going to accept the, this life that I've been living where I haven't thought about it where I've just given in to the things of life that have kind of drugged me down. And now once you've done that, the second objective that we're going to talk about or that, that we're going to do is we're going to accept this. See, the problem with this here is that so many people discredit themselves. So many people just count themselves out. So we're going to accept that no matter what your past or present is, you still have significant purpose. So you're not broken forever. See, we think that we are. We think that, you know, I had a dream that I wanted to be or accomplish something. I had a dream that God made me to be or accomplish a certain thing, but I messed up. I messed up in life. I threw it away. I let alcoholism come in or I let addiction come in. I, I let years of being addicted to pornography come in and steal my purpose. I let years of, of maintaining bad relationships, I let years of, of, of not entering into good relationships, sleeping around, trying to find meaning with other people. I've done crimes against people. I, I've, I've hurt people in my family. Wh wh wherever you are, whatever that is for you, that so many of us have discredited ourselves and said, you know what, I feel like at one point in time I had a calling or a gifting to do a certain thing, but now because of my life, because of the life that I've lived, I just, I can't do that. I'm, dis, I'm discredited. But we've got to understand that it doesn't matter what you did in your past or what you're doing right now in the present, in your seat right now, it doesn't matter. You still have significant purpose. See, a, a truth for you guys to grasp with this is that we are made to pursue His heart because when our heart aligns with His heart, we are most fulfilled. So now this is the point in the message where I'm going to kind of transition us into, the, into some Scripture. But this is the truth that we've got to get before we move into, into the Scripture. So if we think about our purpose being, well, what is it that defines us and why were we made? So we, we were made with the heart. Okay, I'm going to take you guys all the way back to, to the beginning here. I want to take you on, a, on this journey with me. Okay, so everybody in here has a beating heart, correct? Yes. If not, we'll take care of them after the service. <laughs> so everyone in here is a beating heart. Everyone in here was born. Everyone here was made. So when, when God made Adam and Eve, then he created them in his image. And then throughout history, throughout all of mankind, you see the pursuit of God pursuing us. Now, God's greatest desire is not that we do all, it's not that we do this and don't do that, do this, don't do that, follow this commandment, follow that commandment. God's greatest desire is that we accept Jesus as, as our Lord and Savior so that we can worship Him, so that we can be connected with Him. So, think about it this way. Sin separated us from God. So, when Adam and Eve sinned, we were separated from God. Now, the whole rest of the story is about returning us to God. That's the, that's the rest of the Bible. I just summed it all up for you. So much so that Jesus came and he died on the cross for us so that all of our sin would be forgiven, 
All of our sin would be forever wiped away, and then our sin would then be, be completely removed from us. And then guess what? When our sin is removed, then we can come close to God. We can get in connection with God. So all of this is, is about God's heart and our heart connecting and aligning. So here you have this statement again. We are made to pursue his heart. That means that I was made to try and have a heart that reflects God's heart. So I was made to have a heart that reflects God's heart. Now I can do that because Jesus died on the cross for me. And I accept that grace. Without that, I, I couldn't do this. Not at all. So because when my heart aligns with his heart, then I'm the most fulfilled. Is it money that fulfills me the most? No. We think that it does. I'll tell you, so I don't know if anyone in here is aware of um, the game Minecraft. We got any Minecraft players in here? Now, come on. There's a bunch of liars in this room is what there is. I love Minecraft. It's great, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way to kind of disconnect my brain. But the guy that created Minecraft was a guy named Notch. And Notch, when he sold Minecraft to Microsoft, he sold it for just an unbelievable amount of money. It was, it was, it was millions and millions and millions of dollars. And then he went out and, and he spent that money. He bought a house and he would host these parties in, in Hollywood. He had, you know, famous people come in and he had these weekly, just these weekly huge parties. But, but Notch became a recluse. He, he stopped leaving his house, and he did an interview one time, and, and he, he was sort of quoted at saying, saying, with all this money, I no longer have anything to strive towards because I have everything. And I realized that, that there's too many people out there that don't understand that, and so now I can actually connect with no one. See, it's not money that makes us fulfilled. It's having a heart close to God's heart that makes us fulfilled. So we've got to understand that as we go into this scripture. The purpose of this this part of the message is for you to understand that when your heart reflects God's heart, then you are the most fulfilled. And when you're the most fulfilled, you're able to walk into, you're able to fully walk in your purpose. So we're going to jump into the scripture here, and I've got uh, quite a bit to read for you. It's Matthew 25, 31. Let me check my time here. They normally put a a timer on the back. Johan, we don't have a, if you could put a clock on the back, that'd be great. Um, Otherwise, I'll talk for like two hours. No one wants that. (laughs) So, yeah, thanks, Alan. Alan, you let me know when it's 10. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I was going to read a verse for you, but they've taken it down. So Matthew 25, let me pull this out here. So we're going to look here. And what's happening here is this is one of Jesus's... um, he does kind of these five sermons, these five sermon events. And, and this, is, this is what they call sort of the, the discourse at Olivet, which was because it was on a mountain. It was on the, um, the mountain that reflected that here. So let me pull up Matthew 25 here and get to, uh, get to the verse here. Okay, so... We look here at Matthew 25, verse 31. So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk you guys through this and get you guys to follow me. So Jesus has just told people a bunch of parables. All right, He's just shared uh, parables and stories to the crowd. And what he has around him is he has his disciples around him. So this is like the church. So, so Jesus is talking to people that believe in him. All right. So he's giving them parables. He talks about the parable of ten virgins. He talks, which is, you know, it's exciting to read that one. He talks about the parable of the bag of golds. He talks about the parable, all these parables. And then in the end here, in Matthew 25, 31 through 46 here, he, he starts to address the disciples in a way that kind of lets them know what would draw their heart close to his heart. And so he goes on to say, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and majesty and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So what he's doing, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is describing a judgment. And this is a judgment that that is still to come. But this is a judgment where where he's telling the disciples, this is going to happen. This is something where people are are going to happen. So, So he's telling them about an event that is still yet to come. And so the disciples are listening, and and Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to sit on my throne of glory. And then all the nations will be gathered before him for judgment, 
and he will separate them from one and another. So there will come a time where Jesus, you know, is sitting there. All the nations are gathered, and he starts separating people out. And so then we go on to the rest of the verse here, and it says, it says, as a shepherd, so he separates them, he gives them context. So as a shepherd, shep- separates his sheep from the goats. And, and what's, what's brilliant there is see, sheep were worth more money than goats to them because sheep provided um, also the wool, whereas goats didn't do that. So farmers and shepherds would often kind of prize the sheep over the goats. And so here God is saying that, or Jesus is saying that he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Sheep being the good and the righteous, goats being the bad. So he's going to separate them out. And he will put the sheep on his right, which is the place of honor, and the goats on his left, which is a place of rejection. So here's Jesus describing this to them. And then in, in verse 34, it says, it says, Then the king will come and say to those on his right. So he's going to address the sheep, the good people, the righteous people. And he's going to say, Come, you blessed of my father. So you, and that means you are favored of God, appointed to eternal salvation. So these guys are, are, have God's favor and they've been given eternal salvation. This is, this is a good thing for them. And so then he goes on to say, you're going to inherit the kingdom that's been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this is great stuff here. It's like you're, you're on the right side. You're a sheep. You're going to get the kingdom. You're going to get eternal life. I've prepared this for you. So basically, it's, he's saying you guys are sorted. You're taken care of. You're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Like, well done. Clap your hands. Pat yourself on the back. Way to go, team. And so then he goes on to explain it. He says in, in verse 35, so th- this is, this is where, where Jesus kind of lays out these things that draw our heart close to his heart. He says, for I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. Then he goes on to say, and I was in prison, and you came to me, which meant that you were ignoring personal danger. So Jesus is like, you did all this for me. And so then the disciples, they, they don't understand. They're like, well, wait a minute. We didn't do any of that. And so they actually respond in verse 37, and they say, and the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or when did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? And then in verse 38, it says, And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? See, I've got the yous capitalized here. Because the righteous, the disciples, they're trying to understand, when did we do this for you, Lord, for you, Jesus? Because it's easy for us to, to, to come in here and say, I worship you, God. I praise you, Lord. I give my tithes to the church for you. So that's why that's a, a capital Y. But look, look what, what Jesus explains to them. This is where Jesus really lays it out for them. So the king will answer and say to them, I assure you, and I most solemnly say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it for me. See, what Jesus is saying there is what you did for the least of them, you've now done it for me. So it's not that, that the disciples had to do it for to Jesus. It's that the disciples and the righteous, this is something that they were just doing. It's something that was a part of their DNA. It's something that was a part of what they did. They clothed, they fed, they did all those things. And see, the, 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 the thing that we can grab from this is, is this, that the righteous... They will inherit the kingdom, not because of the works that they have done. So get ready. Here's the heart part. It's not because of the works that they've done, but because of their transformed hearts. In response to Jesus' instructions to love, as displayed by their compassion for the least of these. See, what's happened is, it's not that they fed somebody. It's that their heart was transformed. And their heart was aligned with the heart of God. And therefore, the overflow of that, so we're in a series of overflow, the overflow of that fed somebody. It's not that they clothed somebody, 
It's that their heart was aligned with God's heart and they saw that there was a need and the overflow of their heart being that of love, like Jesus said, is what caused them to clothe somebody. And so now that we know that what Jesus is really talking about here is, is having hearts aligned, God's heart, your heart, aligned with each other, then we go back to this. Our purpose is to pursue His heart. Our purpose, why were we made? What is, my, what is my calling in life? What's the definition of why I exist on this earth? It's to pursue His heart. Because when our heart is aligned with His heart, we are the most fulfilled. This is our purpose. Now, each one of you have a unique purpose. You have something unique to yourself. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you something today that if you feel so lost... If you feel like you're on one side of a cliff and that your purpose is so far away on another side of a cliff, if you feel like that there's rain and shadows and and storms and lasers and crocodiles and everything in between you and your purpose and like you can never get there, you can never obtain it, you can never grasp a hold of it, maybe this this message and what we're saying this morning is awakening something in, in you and you're starting to remember a time in your life where you did have a dream, you did have a hope and and you did have a purpose that you wanted to pursue, but that just feels so far away, what what I wanted to do is give you something that would, no matter where you were, who you are, what you're doing, or what you're not doing, you can grasp and apply this. And it will lead you to what your individual, unique purpose is. So if the key is that our heart aligns with God's heart, that can sometimes be hard to do. It can be tricky to do. And so what Jesus says is Jesus is saying, hey, there's these things that you did for the least of these. And because you did those for the least of these, your heart was transformed and it was like my heart. And because your heart was like my heart, then you sit at my right hand. You inherit the kingdom of God. Now he goes on to say in the scripture, which we're not going to read, but he goes on to explain that there's people that don't feed the hungry and clothe people. And they don't care. And they they don't visit the sick. They don't visit people in prison. What he's saying is that people whose heart does not align with his heart. They don't inherit the kingdom. They're separated out. And they don't inherit what God has for them. They don't walk in their purpose. That's not God's desire for anybody. Everyone in this room, I want to see people have an awakening in them. I want to see this church have an awakening of purpose. You know, I've seen that in our, we've got this new team, this pastoral care team. And, and this prayer team and people that, that, that weren't necessarily doing something in the church before have joined this team. And that's part of why we have so much food in our house. It's because they are walking in their purpose. Guess what they're doing? They, they're feeding the hungry. Literally. They're feeding the hungry. But you know what? Out of this, we have people that refuse to let Casey and I cook a dinner. Because their heart is aligned with the heart of Jesus. And they say, there's a family that's in need. We're going to take them a meal. Not only are we going to take them a meal, we're going to take them an abundance. Because they have an abundance mentality. See, see, if you're having a hard time finding your purpose, find somebody that's hungry and feed them. Find somebody that needs something and feed them. Find somebody that's hungry for encouragement and feed them. Find somebody that's hungry for meaning and feed them. Find somebody that, that, is, that is just hungry for safety, give them safety. See, find somebody that, that has a need and fill that need for them. Do that and watch your heart start to follow. Watch your heart start to feel so fulfilled. You know, maybe your heart doesn't align with God's heart and you don't have any desire to do this, but, but it's not that your heart needs to align with God's heart first and then you can do these things because you can also just do these things and it'll help align your heart with God. And so if you start feeding people that are hungry, guess what? You'll start to feel this, this connection. You'll start to feel this authenticity that builds in you. You'll start to feel this, this, this warm thing that comes and it's just this purpose of God because your heart is aligning with His and you're feeling more fulfilled than ever. Or, or if, you don't, if you don't feed the hungry, then it's give a drink to the thirsty. See, you could, there's plenty of people that just are thirsty for water. What happens if you don't have any water? Well, you die. You can't go very long without water. 
There's a lot of people out there that have gone a really long time without the fresh, uh, replenishing, cooling drink of God's truth for them, God's love for them. They need a drink, guys. There's some people that are quite thirsty out there. The world outside of Jesus is a desert. The sun is hot. The sun is, is, is baking. And people just need that cool drink of truth. You know, there's also people that just actually practically need a bottle of water. See, who is it that's thirsty that you can give a drink to? Or you can invite a stranger in. This inviting a stranger into your life or into your, into your home is, it could, be, it could be, you know, you inviting somebody into a mentorship relationship. What, what, what this is, is what, what God's trying to get at here with this, what Jesus is getting at here, is that you are on the lookout for someone that doesn't belong. For someone that doesn't, isn't in a place where they feel like they belong. You are on the look for somebody that looks like they're a stranger. See, I believe that this is a great church because it's hard for people to walk in here and be a stranger. It's hard for people to walk in here and someone not to try and pull them in and invite a stranger in. There is not a stranger in this city that exists that is not welcome in this church. And there should be a portion of your heart that's set aside to welcome anybody that, that, that is a stranger in. See, the heart behind this is that we're not insider focused. We're always looking. We're always on the look. Who out there feels like a stranger that I can invite in? And then there's clothe the naked. You know, how, how, I can't think of a more embarrassing thing than to feel naked and exposed. Not, not only could this be physically and literally, but this could also just be emotionally, emotionally naked and exposed, humiliated. There's people out there that feel like that they're just so, you know, open and everything that they have is exposed and there's no way that they can hide, the, you know, their, their, their private life. There's no way that they can hide the things that they don't want people to see or know about. And they're just sort of stuck there naked and exposed for the world to see. And instead, we can have a heart where we look for those people and we can clothe them. We can, we can give them cover. We can give them dignity. We can restore to them and take away the humility that they feel. Instead, we can clothe them. And not only can we clothe them, we can clothe them in robes. We can clothe them in, 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 in just abundance, in an abundance of blessing. And then you can visit and care for the sick. You can take care of the people that are sick. You, you, can, you can go, and then this is a literal thing, like you can go and just visit people that are sick and take care of them. See, it's, it's you saying it's, it's just not about me and my life, but I'm going to look outward at the lives of others that need some help. And then the last thing that Jesus talks about is, is even just fearlessly visiting those that are in prison. See, what we start to see here when we start to examine these, these things that Jesus points out here is that, is that Jesus has said, because your heart aligns with mine, you're doing these things. Or I could say because you're doing these things, your heart will begin to align with His. And what this will do is this will point you back to your purpose. Let's go back to the definition of purpose. And then we'll, we'll end with this here. Purpose. The reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. If you want to find your purpose, why you exist, the best thing that you can do is look to align your heart with God's heart. And if you don't know how to do that, then Matthew 25 gives you some really practical things to do. You can feed the hungry. You can give water to the thirsty. You can clothe the naked. You can visit the sick. You can visit those that are in prison. You can invite a stranger in. If we can do those simple things, then I promise you, God will start to unfold in your life that purpose, that dream, that thing that was in you at one point in time and start to ignite something that's just so incredibly exciting for you. So my hope and my desire today as we get ready to pray and, and, and stand in worship is, is this. It's that you connect with God in a way over this holiday season that draws you close to Him and, and that ignites in you 
that purpose that, that maybe you've walked away from or that you've lost. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, laying out in Scripture for us.